Professor Sushani Kumar Mishra is a double PhD scholar, S1 from Semiotics at General Nehru University, and another from, from French Department at University of Delhi. He teaches at the Department School of Language, Literature, and Culture Studies at JNU. His areas of interest are semiotics, comparative literature, translation study, Indian and Western intellectual traditions and language teaching theories, and implementation. He has, he, he was honored with various awards like Young Scholars Award received from Indian Councils of Philosophical Research in 1989 on paper written Religion in the Age of Science and Technology. Another award received from Indian Scientific Translators Associations on Role of Translation in Cultural Integration in 1992. And also received award from Katha Translators Awards 2000 for translations of Raj Kamal Jha's Mightily Short Stories into English. Professor Sushant Kumar Mishra has published good numbers of books, chapters, and research articles, as well as translations. Not only he conducted and attended the national and international conferences, seminars, workshops, etc., but he also delivered academic lectures and thought courses in many institutions and universities in India and abroad, in India and abroad. He has been delivered lectures to NTM, Translation Training Program from the earlier batches also. With this short introduction, may I invite Professor Sushan Kumar Misra to deliver the lecture. Sir, I welcome you. Thank you, Atro. Uh, so now the topic as translation and translation studies, this is uh, uh, something very interesting because one is translation, which is almost uh, uh, one of the oldest professions, if I may call it profession. So one of the oldest uh, vocations or professions of the world, translation. And the other is translation studies, which is one of the most recent uh, disciplines uh, in uh, humanities or one may take it uh, in other fields also, but at least in the field of humanities, definitely. And that is my field, so I would concentrate on that because I have heard about translation and translation studies from scientists, from uh, social scientists. And uh, but uh, let me confine to our field only, as we do uh, in humanities mostly. So this is translation from the oldest, and translation studies is one of the most recent disciplines. In fact, till 1980s, there was hardly any talk of any buzzword on translation studies in the academy. Of course, it was coming, but uh, as a discipline for studies it was hardly there and even now uh, so far as i know there may be two or three departments in universities across india or even abroad there are very few places where translation studies per se is done apart from the vocational aspects of translation though of course both of them are very closely interrelated and at, uh, uh, so far as i know there are two departments in central universities and there may be some other departments in india on translation studies they take up translation studies and various aspects of it in this lecture i have not touched upon the interpretation aspect of course interpretation we understand as explaining the text but here in the context of translation i understand by interpretation uh, putting the text uh, in, in subjecting the text or putting the text into translation in oral format. So when it is a spoken, consecutive and uh, simultaneous interpretations are there, these two are very important aspects of uh, translation and of course on translation studies also. So that aspect I have not touched much with the paucity of time. Uh, I have concentrated on the larger aspects, however most of uh, whatever I will discuss will be applicable to those aspects also. So as we know, as we have uh, seen in the previous lecture and uh, Avir also would have seen definitely that translation has two aspects. One is lexis and the other is praxis. There is someone sitting and translating the text. That is a part of uh, praxis that you actually 
uh, translate a text and uh, as in history you may see us uh, because translation is one of the oldest professions we have very long traditions on translation whether we talk of europe or whether we talk of india along with various definitions that have come with translation studies but one of the basic definitions is that you create an equivalent text now what whatever that equivalent text may mean because that's itself a very uh, problematic proposition that uh, the text uh, y is an equivalent text of x uh, and i give you an example for understanding this uh, when bible the old testament i'm talking the old testament it was translated from hebrew to greek uh, of course uh, it, it is not possible to say that uh, the greek translation is uh, an equivalent text and hence uh, the, some stories had to be coined because the authority and since it was a, a kind of a religious text so when the old testament was translated it was translated it is said that it was translated by 70 persons separately uh, and uh, they all came exactly to the same translation now how is it possible today we can understand very well that it is not possible that all the 70 translators would come exactly to the same target text that is not possible however this is how the story goes and what is the purpose of the story it might it, to our contemporary mind it will be simply a, an, an attempt to establish the authority of the text that the text why the text target text why is actually an equivalent text of the original hebrew old testament text so we may debate it further and there are certain issues from Quran, some examples were given. Similarly, uh, from the Bible also, some examples can be given and many other texts, uh, the examples can be given. But the point is that there is a praxis where we sit down and we choose and we translate. And for that, the training helps, but it is not necessary. If you know the subject, many times, you, if you are a bilingual person, it is not sufficient. But if you know the subject and you are not trained in translators, as a translator, then also you may work on it. And I have seen such things happening. For example, uh, there are translations of texts uh, by those who are not trained and uh, they have to undertake, for example, the, the second sex by Simon de Beauvoir, it is translated. Now it has another translation also by those who know the subject and by two of Canadian women, but I'm not talking of that. The first translation, uh, which is in uh, English and from where our Hindi translation or Indian texts also, any Indian translation you find that is mostly from that uh, original English translation. Uh, Hindi is Prabhat Khetan and there you can find uh, several changes etc happening because the first translator towards English was not at all related to the discipline of uh, whatever uh, whether feminist studies or literary studies or social sciences or humanities, not at all. He was a man related to some scientific disciplines. So these kind of things can happen. However, he is the one who translated with all the faults, etc., that we may discuss. And it's not about uh, being critical, but it is about the evaluation which is done critically. That's all. Um, so we have to understand that there is a lexis. Uh, aspect and this is the praxis which is very important but now uh, more and more as we the world has been coming together and the languages have been merging and the boundaries between languages and cultures have been merging uh, we uh, have to undertake translation as a very uh, translation both acts and theoretically uh, as a very serious discipline because in our contemporary times translation can uh, create havocs and translation can um, can be problematic uh, in context of uh, cultural interaction in context of textual interactions of various cultures etc so as a discipline it emerged along with um, with almost uh, when we started talking of global village etc all these ideas they all came in 70s uh, by 80s within almost a decade or maximum you can say 15 years uh, we started talking of translation studies Along with that, comparative disciplines also emerge. So I'm talking mostly of that. And um, I will keep moving the, uh, the slides. I will be talking about the slides. You follow whatever is written on the, on the slides. Of these, and I will be explaining them uh, in a simpler vocabulary in my own words as I understand uh, these topics. 
So I have talked about equivalence, etc. Now you can see textual interpretations. This is where a translator is at the crossroad. This is where the translator faces the problem. And for this, the translator has to undertake certain kinds of researches. And here, there are two types. One is research for translation, and the other is research in translation studies. For example, research for translation. Uh, from Quran, one example was given that we, we have one word which has several equivalents. A, originally in Arabic, and similarly, if you take the word camel, for example, you have some, it is said that we, we have approximately 10,000 words for camel uh, in Arabic, uh, in various uh, shapes, uh, and uh, across the entire Arabic uh, speaking land. Similarly, uh, if you take the translation of Ram Charit Manas towards English, which is a text by Kursidas um, in India, in, in, in Avadi, and you find at least 30 words for lotus in original, at least 30, if not more, at least 30 words for original and in various contexts. And how do you translate them? It has several metaphorical uh, issues also where uh, the eyes can be compared to lotus, where hands can be compared to lotus, where feet can be compared to lotus. So how to take care of that? And for that, a translator has to do research. So this is one aspect of research. And the other aspect is related to translation studies, and that is translation and translation studies. At one point, they get a start; they start merging. Suppose I gave the example of 30 words to be replaced by one word only, because lotus doesn't have many synonyms in English. It is not a civilizational or cultural experience for them. Hence, we have issues related to translation studies: the loss of meaning the skewing of meaning, the objectivity being lost, the metaphors being lost. So what is actually being lost and what are the, the, what are the strategies by which the translators have tried to translate, etc., etc. All these form a part of translation studies as, the, as we see that there has been a historical attempt. In recent times, by recent times, I mean at least two to three centuries, William Jones uh, Abhigyan Shakuntalam was given. You see, the, in, the, in the translated text, the word ring appears uh, as a very prominent aspect. Now, Abhigyan Shakuntalam, but the title itself, you see, um, the, 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 the word Gyan and Abhigyan uh, is very important and related to knowledge, but the ring is not related to that. So, uh, when two cultures meet, then uh, at one point, we have uh, a very technical word, uh, avigyan, gyan, and it is simply being translated by uh, rings and such common words. So you see, the, the cultural aspects reflect are reflected in the title given itself. So this will be a part of translation studies. The translator had done his research. The translator, whether William Jones or later translations, whatever we may, uh, whoever is the translator, because there are many versions. The translation, all the translators have done their research, definitely. So, and they have come up with their choices. Now, what are the choices? If you start discussing that and various choices made, that become different domain areas of research. And here, a very important domain area is for a translator and also for translation studies is where they're all much is glossary and terminology making research. For every translator, when I said that the translator of Ram Charit Manas had to choose 30 words related to Lotus, and then make one word. The person is making a glossary and the person is making a terminology for that particular field. Whatever be the field of translation, whether it is technical, scientific, social, uh, science, uh, judicial, uh, judiciary translation, whatever be the field of translation, the first and foremost task is to make a glossary and terminology, even literary text. Certain um, uh, scholars would have their own uh, uh, their own uh, ways of putting, for example, Pension, when the Pension says, if you read the story, Idga, it's a very famous story. How do you translate Idga? Now, there can be various uh, strategies, but the first and foremost, you identify Idga glossary, uh, in your glossary, in a terminology. So, Idga will be there, Chimta, the word, where in, all such words in the writings of Pension will be there. And so there are, whoever uh, writes, there are, in, in literary texts also, there are specific terminology related to each and every author. The other aspect of this is the style. So the relation of translation and translation theory, we may discuss, is there actually a relation? But that is not important for us. Though, of course, in translation studies, this will be a part. The other opinion would be translation as an act is not directly related to translation theory. And this is what has been upheld at least till 1990s as you may feel, though some theoreticians have started emerging, but most of the books on this aspect, you 
actually find it uh, post 1980s only and in 1990s it has started emerging that no even for translation especially in the aspects of literary and social texts the translation theories are important because some kind of sensitive sensitization is required when a translator is undertaking a text for translation these kinds of sensitization though it has happened earlier also for example the communist text see, uh, when unesco prepares a certain kind of um, um, a certain kind of index uh, of uh, the books translated with and they interpret it with their own understanding of course, which is uh, according to the understanding of the 21st century approximately, I would say. But we have to understand also, and we have to uh, acknowledge also, that the earlier erstwhile USSR is one of the most important powers which actually uh, invested a lot on translation. The Most of the countries where UNESCO is functioning, they are monolingual. They have been traditionally monolingual all along the 20th century only in 21st century or in the last decade of 20th century they accepted the uh, the positive existence of bilingualism and without bilingualism translation uh, is not a very important act so translation uh, is very important the moment we identify bilingualism and bilingualism has always existed but theoretically it was not accepted linguistically it was not accepted we always talk of one mother tongue and people with uh, one language, one culture, one nation. So this uh, age old 400, 500 years, we have not acknowledged that. So in this context, there is translation theory and there is an act of translation. What are the relationships? We have, of course, two different opinions, but more and more the opinions diverge now that they are closely related because there are cultural aspects, there are linguistic aspects, there are stylistic aspects. And in, in the stylistic aspects, we have ordinary, ordinary sentences, daily sentences, which have to be taken into account as, for example, in English, uh, you may not say the tomatoes are going, but in Hindi, we do say uh, a, a housewife may tell her husband that a tomato ja raha hai, and uh, she only means that uh, someone who is selling the tomatoes uh, is uh, walking the street or is going down the street. So please go and get the tomatoes. So, but you, you see, this is a stylistic variation where, um, of the tomatoes are going, and uh, most of the Indian languages use such a strategy. So, th this kind of stylistic variations are very important for translation studies and they have an implication in translation as an act itself so more and more we feel that there are stylistic issues and for this the analysis of text is very important i gave you all the examples on the basics of the analysis of text and there are various levels of analyzing the text one textbook here i have given um, and uh, of course many scholars would give and uh, i have uh, not in this slide but another slide uh, which I didn't put here at the end, if you want, I can give you some basic books also to study in this particular field. So the textual level, the referential level, then the cohesive level, these are various levels on translation, but all of them come from a very important thinker, uh, which I, whom I will mention um, just after some time, uh, because these thinkers, uh, though they are very important, but sometimes they, their names are not so known in this particular field. So I will tell you the names uh, gradually. Uh, Let's see. So here we have domain area research. One is selectively look for books, articles, materials dealing with the area of the document. And then you find the lexicographical equivalence. For example, uh, just now my previous speaker has given the examples of the text created by uh, some DST, Department of Science and Technology, and similarly. But some of the languages accept the terms, some of the languages do not accept the terms. There also, it is very difficult to say that everybody accepts the terms because uh, whether in Tamil or Uriya or Hindi or uh, any language, some terms gain currency, some terms don't gain currency. It is simply a matter of uh, a matter of uh, social linguistic choices and there is no specific reason for this. Very difficult to assign the reasons, but um, it happens. Just, just uh, in language it happens. Most of the language is a very living being. Just as uh, we, when we go to choose a particular menu in, in a restaurant, we choose as a living being and uh, there is no uh, rule for me to choose a particular menu. It is simply my instinctive choice of that particular moment. So that happens in language also. Language behaves like a, a very living organism. 
and uh, it keeps growing. Uh, and there we have lexical equivalences, terminology identification, and preparing list of equivalent terms. For this, the translator has to do a lot of research. And lexicography in this context is a very important aspect of translation studies. Because see, uh, as an individual, I'm making lexi lexicological choices. Definitely, there is a lexical choice that I have to exercise as a translator. But in the field of translation studies, though lexicography is a separate field also, but we have to understand that lexicography, in lexicography, we talk of making translations, uh, sorry, making dictionaries, making lexicons of various types. And lexicon making for trans for the purpose of translation is itself a particular act. And there are lexicographical uh, works being done in this particular field. And you, you see, even in the uh, nowadays when we talk of machine translation, a lot of times people are making lexicological equivalences. It, and that is a very closely linked discipline of translation studies, though a lot of studies is required in this area, especially between English and Indian languages and Indian within Indian languages also. English and Indian languages, more and more it is happening thanks to Google and such uh, international tools who actually want to capture the Indian market in various ways. But more uh, work uh, is definitely desired and between Indian languages it is definitely uh, desired more and more. So interaction with experts uh, is required for translation. That is the translation research. Uh, if I don't know the subject area, I need to know. If I'm translating to ancient, I would prefer, uh, preferably interact with a particular scholar who knows the um, uh, uh, Princhand, who has worked on Princhand, if I want to translate from Ramana Bharti, I should know about that person. If I want to translate the Shaivite literature of Kannada tradition, then I should know. I have translated, but um, I have myself translated uh, towards uh, some Indian languages, uh, the Shaivite literature of uh, Kannada tradition. Now, I have to interact with the discipline and domain experts of that. Now, that I'm doing, I'm working as a translator and then that kind of research. But then institutions are also dealing with similar areas. And those institutions who are dealing, they are compiling the books, the final documents to be vetted. Who will do all these things? So who are the experts? Who can do? Now here, not only an essential aspect of translation, but an essential aspect of translation studies. And then you can see that it has evolved as an academic university discipline in the last three to four decades. Even National Translation Mission is established almost in the similar times. Though texts were translated, even scientific texts were translated earlier also. One of my own first uh, uh, texts uh, on uh, mathematics and, uh, and uh, similar subjects came from USSR. And those USSR texts, they tried to uh, provide their uh, mathematical texts, their texts on physics, etc., etc., uh, to Indian uh, learners. And they had their own ways of presenting it. There is an ideological inclination also in doing mathematics. And so for that purpose, they wanted to present their text. So texts were translated. But as an idea that we should study such texts and to understand the ideological inclinations of such translations, the, in, the academic university disciplines across the world, and especially in India, I'm talking more specific to India um, right now. So um, it has started uh, almost three to four decades back, and NTM is itself an example of that. When we started talking of knowledge commissions and we started talking of knowledge transactions across the world, though it has been happening since uh, times immemorial, but there is a specific impetus to this kind of idea, and that impetus led to uh, establishment of various agencies and uh, which deal with translation not only as, as an act but as a historical evolution of mankind and as a historical evolution of ideas and that leads to an academic university discipline which deals with actual translations of course the annotations analysis political implications etc etc and it is a multidisciplinary research it is not just one way uh, I just mentioned the stylistics, and the stylistic itself cannot be simply unilingual because it um, it involves various aspects of language and various aspects of culture. So it might have implications: sociology, anthropology, urban spacing, etc., etc., architecture. And that's why you see in recent times now, from this batch itself, you can see that the students of humanities are allowed in the field. Of, in IITs now, how come it is happening? That uh, traditionally an engineer is, is supposed to be good in physics and chemistry and mathematics, but that is not sufficient. We have to understand because the kind of translation, uh, uh, at a very abstract level, uh, an architect translates the ideas, all the ideas, all the cultural ideas of living in a particular society in a particular time. Now, 
how do you know about those habits it is only by the text it is only through the ideas that are being translated to that architect in various texts so we have various aspects in translation studies and that leads to certain kind of interculturality i talked of cultural coexistence cultural existence cultural coexistence so there a certain kind of inter, uh, intercultural um, in, uh, studies and comparative studies i have given you examples from bible which i had told you earlier also but there are various uh, biblical traditions um, uh, in india itself uh, we had jews who migrated they were um, uh, a lot different than the jews in africa the jews in the, in uh, in germany etc jews in europe and similarly christianity also had different um, perspective the biblical translation is there the bible is the same but i don't find any indian christianity any any shade of indian christianity targeting the jews that doesn't happen it has not happened in any kind of christian literature you take the christian literature of goa for example since portuguese times of inquisition it doesn't happen so this is just one example i have given you there are n number of other examples in, in biblical translation itself in biblical traditions itself it's not one bible there are various bibles in malayalam they found various bibles and uh, some of the uh, some of the biblical uh, texts were burned down also that is history so in translation studies we will talk about all this and the comparative and inter intercultural studies both of them come very close to translation studies and you can see the comparative studies evolved little earlier but the moment it started bifurcating it bifurcated into translation studies and comparative literature especially in the, in the studies of humanity the comparative literature became a very closely allied discipline of translation studies in fact in most of the places uh, in, in in most of the universities these two often get combined uh, in terms of research in terms of their studies etc and various scholars have done it Uh, since uh, um, they have been studying uh, the texts uh, written during colonial times etc so i have given you examples from arabic also and there are various uh, examples from greek to arabic greek to turkish and later and um, you, you can read texts of uh, sappho who, who is supposed to be a lesbian poet of um, uh, of antiquity and now look at this uh, sappho who is a lady who is supposed to be a lesbian and uh, from the aristocratic class her text was written in uh, ionian greek and the text is preserved later by very conservative turkish speaking scholars not only uh, the orthodox christians but also by some muslim clerics because it was simply a text from the yod they all preserved it and thus it has come in fragments to us now imagine Uh, the resistance of the religious scholarship towards lesbian poetry or lesbian literature in our contemporary times but similar uh, lesbian uh, writings or um, at least uh, sappho's writings uh, is very important in literature for lesbian writings and from antiquity and those texts are preserved by the same kind of forces across centuries so there are various cultural aspects the intercultural it is ionian greek which is not the best form of greek attic greek is considered to be the best form where in which homer and many other scholars have written many other creative uh, minds have written but is still a text of ionian greek is preserved by all kinds of forces in turkish and in turkish speaking areas and those days alexandria turkey and all these aspects especially in turkey uh, various um, civilizations were meeting various cultural aspects were meeting so all these aspects are very important for translation study but as an act of translation is not not happening nobody is thinking of translating the poems of sappho but they are trying to preserve it and what are the ideological inclinations of preserving it so act so in translation studies we go beyond the act of translation a certain kind of comparative study also involves and comparative literature also gets involved very closely because a comparative understanding cannot happen without translation an intercultural studies cannot happen without translation we talk nowadays of cultural translations also in which many times there is no notion of the source text or the target text in one of the notions for example uh, when you write about an arabic um, area the, the example was given just now if you talk of rusul we could talk of uh, from um, prophet now if you translate it by that's not possible so then how do you write on an arabic um, uh, culture using the words of english using the words of french how is it possible and uh, okay arabic can claim it's it's a space because it is a dominant language it it, it, it is culturally it is uh, economically dominant in contemporary times initially they also did not claim the more economically dominant they became they started claiming so that simply means that 
when we talk of Africa, where tribes and tribal language groups are not very economically dominant, their languages may be getting subdued. And when their language and the cultural translations are happening, by cultural translation means that there are texts written on their culture in English language, which may not have enough sensitivity to their own ways of understanding the, the, the event around them. And since times immemorial it has been happening, at least 1000 to 1500 years it has been happening, that the texts are being presented in, whether in Arabic also, or whether in contemporary English or Latin or, or, or whatever languages, depending upon the, the kind of political power at a particular point of time. So when this kind of, of uh, cultural translation is happening, we are writing on a, on a particular social group in a language which is not very closely linked to that particular cultural uh, tradition. Then also we have the issues of uh, comparative uh, studies as well as translation studies. First we addressed all of them such issues in comparative studies and comparative literature later we understood no 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 in, in, in itself it can be a, a very vast discipline so comparative uh, studies and uh, comparative literature more specifically and translation studies they became very closely linked and they're very closely linked to stylistic issues in this particular context if you don't understand the stylistic issue and we don't relate to the reality in the same way then we have a problem and here I mentioned you earlier also this point and uh, I have come back again to this uh, aspect of translation studies where a translator also has to be very sensitive. Whether you make your own ideological choices or whatever be your choices, but you have to make it in a very sensitized, sensitive, sensible and selective manner. And one of the pioneering studies in this field is by Charles Bailly, uh, Shah Bailly we say. Uh, he is a direct student of, no, 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 uh, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I made a mistake. He's not a student of Saussure. He is a contemporary of Saussure and he is the one, uh, one of the persons who actually uh, edited the book of Saussure for which Saussure is known. Saussure is, known, is not known for most of his own writings, but both are very, very important. But uh, he is known more for the writings done posthumously on him collecting his works, etc., by Shahl Bai, and then there is another linguist also, uh, it's, um, Albert Sachet, but I will not talk about him, though his work is also very important. But here I confine myself to the works in stylistics, Shahl Bai. Unfortunately, the text is not translated. And you see, this is also one of the reasons why the study of stylistics is heavily skewed in um, English traditions. We don't get to know much about it because Shahl Bai and his contemporary, three, four years, a few years later to him, uh, Saussure, they all worked on certain tradition of Sanskrit texts and Latin and Greek texts, definitely, when they talked um, um, of all those. There, there is a certain tradition in, in Europe, and um, that tradition involved, uh, of course, centuries of studies on Latin and Greek, and one or two centuries of history on Persian, and more specifically to Sanskrit. So they all talked about it. There, there are the texts written prior to him on this. Now, Shahlabai, when he talks of this, uh, the stylistic studies become very important and most of what we do is in the stylistics today actually uh, he is the precursor of that and if you read in translation studies one of the texts which is often uh, referred to is vinet and vine and Darwell net it is available in english translation also though originally they had um, um, they had compared um, english and french uh, stylistics in their day-to-day -day usages Earlier it was not done. Stylistics was um, dominantly a discipline related to literature and literary studies, but originally it was not there. Uh, but uh, more and more they started understanding in day-to-day -day speech it is happening. And since language is, uh, uh, um, is being accepted as it is being spoken, because prose became uh, the very important um, uh, part of uh, literary writing. So more and more the language started getting closer to the daily speech since 18th century onwards approximately prior to that uh, poetry was the dominant mode uh, till 17th century. Uh, since 18th century prose became a very important aspect um, of literature and uh, even poetry um, uh, had its own uh, refinements in terms of um, or changes rather to say uh, in terms of uh, uh, various kind of uh, poetic devices related to metrical compositions, etc. So more and more, the, this kind of comparative philology was required. This kind of 
comparative stylistic studies was required. So these two aspects are very important and more and more research in translation studies, which will be very useful for translator also. I'll give an example of uh, tomatoes are going, we cannot say in English, but in Hindi or several, most of the Indian languages, we do say such um, uh, expressions. So similarly, research in the areas of theory and praxis, both are important. We mean the domain areas related to translation studies, because for translation theory is not in, um, a, a, an area of research. But a training in the theory, a training in comparative linguistics, in contrastive linguistics, in comparative philology, etc., etc., they are very important. And in translation studies, we have ideological issues and some examples are given. I have given you a list, it's a few examples as it is happening. For example, colonial era translation in 19th century, 20th century, it has happened. William Jones text was cited in the previous lecture. Others who have cited several other texts. There are uh, texts from, uh, which went from India and that brought uh, various uh, uh, new ideas in Europe, for example, the Mritche Katikam, which is a text which when it was translated for the first time in the entire European mind, they realized that a low grade woman within quotes, low grade, that means a prostitute, can be a main protagonist. Or prior to that, the European mind could not even understand that a prostitute can be the main protagonist until that time they were kings, queens, etc., etc., and some commoners also. But prostitute being the main dominant person, um, um, the main heroine, uh, within quotes, if I use the, the main protagonist of a text, of a literary text, the idea goes from India. So this kind of um, study, this kind of translation, images of societies, class differences, the nation building, etc., these are all parts of some examples that I mentioned here for translation study. Then translation per se, both theoretical issues and research and topics generally taken for translation. For example, what is transcreation? Texts and societies, how they are closely linked. Various theories related to feminist theory of translation. There is feminist uh, issues in translation. I, mean, I have cited just now, uh, for example, uh, this uh, um, Simone de Beauvoir. Now, when you translate Simone de Beauvoir, there are various specific issues. For example, um, uh, from English to Hindi, let's say, for example, uh, you see, you cannot change numbers. There is no ambiguity. If I say 18 years girl, it is 18 years girl. There's no confusion of 16 or 14 or whatever. So. Uh, in, uh, in the original, Simon de Beauvoir had written 14, because that was the age of majority, at, uh, or generally, and she didn't mean actually sexually explicit uh, behavior, but uh, when it was translated towards uh, an American text, they made it 18, and when it was translated into Hindi by Prabhakhetan, she mentions the word Sola Sala Ladki, because the Shodashi or Sola Sala Ladki is a, is a concept. And that's all. And whatever be, uh, be the constitutional age, at that point of time, the issue was not there. So it is sola sala ladki. So, and that simply means certain kind of physical, hormonal, etc. changes. So the notion itself is very uh, different. And you are representing it by a specific number. And you see, you see how numbers are related to the cultural traditions. Number, there is no ambiguity about it. In certain other referent words, there can be an ambiguity. But when I say 14, when I say 16, when I say 18, there is no ambiguity about it. These are very mathematically defined rational terms. There cannot be any ambiguity. 14 is 14. If I ask um, somebody to give me 14 apples, there is no ambiguity in it. There is no possibility of any ambiguity. But at a 14 years girl and 16 years girl, 18 years girl, uh, can be ambiguous in cultural contexts. So uh, we have to understand and this kind of translations are there. Then anthologies are made and such uh, aspects are studied, commentaries are made, translation and transaction of knowledge, how they are happening through the texts and commentaries related to that. All these become part of the translation study. So some examples I have cited, some more examples, literary reception, how texts are received. For example, I saw in one of the comments in, during the earlier lecture uh, that uh, we, by getting the translation of William Jones, uh, Gate uh, started uh, dancing. Now it is a kind of reception. So what kind of reception did it get? In some areas, maybe it was banned and, and some parts of the original Abhigyana Shakuntalam was not even considered worthy of translation. So what kind of reception do you get? And it has happened. For example, when Mughals started writing uh, on Northeast India, one of the professors of Persian, Professor Mazhar Asif, he has translated certain texts. Um, so from SMEs to, uh, sorry, written, uh, texts written in Persian by Mughal uh, emissaries, uh, 
and when they were translated towards towards SMEs, the SMEs could not accept it because the viewpoint was from the Persian speaking society of a particular time with particular uh, cultural or uh, religious or literary ideology, etc. So what kind of social implications, what kind of ideological issues are there, textual traditions are there, there are various textual traditions also in which a lot is left implicit and a lot is considered biblical translation I have given. There are various examples. Hierarchy is a word in biblical translation which has posed challenges for long. Is hierarchy vertical? Because in original Hebrew, hierarchy was not vertical but simply a horizontal arrangement of uh, things. The way I arrange hierarchically things on my table. So it is simply a structural arrangement on my table. But um, in some societies, it became hierarchical. So this is one example from biblical translation. Other examples, textual traditions. Um, we do have textual traditions when we compare, uh, uh, let's say, for example, eyes, ear, uh, um, hand, and feet, all of them with lotus. So there is a certain textual tradition. Uh, uh, when Tulsi Das is writing, when Subramanian Bharti is writing, they all are writing certain textual traditions. And then in that textual tradition, there are certain modifications that also keep happening. So this kind of issues are there, um, are dealt with in translation studies. And they all are dealt in comparative studies also. So comparative literature and both and uh, reception, they all became uh, very important in 1980s and 90s as we became more and more closer due to technological interventions and inventions so they all start they can, uh, they all became very important and lexicon making size this tool of making tool of translation i have already talked about it and this field i i'm mentioning it again because in, it is very closely linked to machine translation also most of the work that we do in machine translation are related to two issues uh, of course there are technical aspects also but the, the linguistic aspects are mostly related to these two issues. We have to terminology equivalence and expression equivalence, not only in terms of semantics, in terms of meaning, but also in terms of a stylistic presentation. Now, the stylistic presentation in different languages are different. In one language itself, they are different from time to time, from region to region. So all these variations we have to take into account. And this is all part of the tools of translation and evolution of tools of translation. Making the tools of translation are very important aspect of translation studies in general. And they're very helpful for translators also in their day-to-day -day exercises. So theory is an experience in translation practices, including tools of translation, contrastive study of language and style. So all these I have talked about it. So language interaction situations. Now this is a very important aspect. What happens during a war? This is a language interaction situation. Language interaction situations during peacetime. Rejection of each other. For example, Houthi rebels uh, presently in Yemen, they are supposed to speak Arabic. Those who attack them, Saudis, they also speak Arabic. At the same time, they maintain another language also. So similarly, in war situations, it happens. In India, in, uh, anywhere you see the conflict situations, the language analysis of all that is happening for example, in um, in the Tibetan area, whether it is Indian radio that is beaming something, the Chinese would study, how would you identify that? It is related to translations, it is related to certain kind of linguistic expressions, certain kind of stylistic expressions, and translation from Indian languages to Chinese or Chinese to Indian languages, etc. and vice versa. And it happens in every border area where language, and I mean to say not national border areas, but it happens at least um, um, at social level, it happens at every area where language interaction, contact situations happen because languages change gradually. And then there is one point when you identify, OK, this particular area, we have some kind of mixture. And the other areas, which are far from that border area between two languages, there are other forms of languages that are being spoken between Odisha and Bengal, you will find it. Between India and Myanmar, you will find it. So whether it's a national boundary or it is simply a linguistic social group boundary, you will find this kind of um, uh, translation, recreation, uh, transcreation, all that is happening, mixing um, the kinds of um, languages, etc. And there the certain kind of contrast study, they all are very helpful. Because even if I translate into um, uh, the standard Uriya or the standard Maitri or the standard Tamil, this issue is very important because the source text might have similar issues. So how do you represent similar issues? And similarly, we have several aspects of it. And there comes a point 
where we have not only perspectives from colonial orientalists etc all these are mentioned these are all part of dominant uh, areas that what said was mentioned in the previous lecture all this is there but the very important aspect in the entire issue as we study in transhistory is the dynamism in meaning and determination of meaning as decided by ideological perspectives so i'm giving you a larger term then the moment you go dynamism there are various aspects of it meaning various aspects of it dynamism in meaning various aspects of it then you determine meaning because at one point of time you cannot have choose two choices in language language is in that sense very linear so you have to determine when i speak it is very linear when you understand it is not linear and that is a challenge in the language in translation studies because my spoken word will be one only but your understanding not cannot be one it it will be uh, it will have its own multiplicity and this is a very um, ideologically driven individually driven etc exercise so this aspect is very important in translation and translation studies these are the larger gamuts in which we function and now i think i should stop uh, if you all require i can provide another slide on the uh, texts but that i think uh, most of you can search yourself and others would have given that's why i have not put it here so i think i would welcome some questions 10 extra minutes uh, were given uh, so if there are questions which uh, if i am capable of answer i will be very happy if not i will take my learning and i will uh, learn for future and so by and large this is what i have to say that uh, areas in translation some more examples multiple ideological perspectives all these issues are always there and source and target text and logical perspective these issues will be there and very important i will end uh, before i welcome the questions that uh, by uh, by a citation uh, from vakyapadi of bhartri hari that the intellect requires critical acumen by familiarity with different traditions and their translation is very important how much does one really understand by merely following one's own reasoning only by one's own reasoning here it is meant by one's own trans, trans, by, by understanding the textual tradition of one's own discipline of knowledge so more and more we all need to learn and translation translation studies comparative studies they are all closely linked and they all are part of that uh, that uh, globalization phenomenon and, and the, the kind of uh, world in which we are living where we have to uh, come close to each other in uh, various social interaction situations uh, thank you